Hello and welcome to our online service this week. My name is Debbie Pow and I'm Associate Priest at St Stephen's Lansdowne and St Mary's Chalcombe. I'm also a farmer's wife so it's lovely to be able to welcome you once again to one of our fields. A field where I've broadcast a couple of services before, uh, previously with a standing crop in. Uh, now it's all been harvested. I've chosen to come outside into the field just to remind us that whilst we love to come and worship uh, on uh, usually a Sunday but we love to worship, life, uh, faith isn't just about uh, worshipping in the service but about bringing our faith out into the world around us uh, which is what we'll be thinking about a little bit later. This is a simple service, there's no liturgy, it just contains some prayers the readings and the sermon from uh, our services on Sunday. Let's just begin with a moment of quiet and peace, just to allow our souls to catch up, our bodies to catch up with our souls, really. A moment of quiet. Beloved one, let me be aware of you within me and with me. Let me attend to each part of my body, all that is well and all that is poorly. Help me let go of all in my life that lies in shadow, what I've done, what I've said and what I've thought all that is not helpful, all that dishonours and mars your image in me. Have mercy on me. Let me trust your presence as I listen. Let me not be distracted by the clamour of every thought, but let my heart be still my mind unlearned, my face unmasked. Let me not be afraid of all I know I cannot be, but let me trust that I am enough, that just to be here is enough, just as I am. And to trust that you, you look on me, my beloved, with eyes that see and eyes that love, for you are love itself. Amen. And the prayer, the collect for the 16th Sunday of Trinity. God who draws near, who comes to our level, whose nature is revealed in lordship laid aside. Give us grace to welcome you in the one who tests the bounds in our, of our community, in the child, the outcast, the one who comes with no power, save that of retaking our, our heart through Jesus Christ, the one who will be betrayed. Amen. Our first reading comes from James' book, chapter 3. Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness, born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false of to the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be on a dishonor and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is pure, then peaceable, gentle, 
willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is shown in, sown in peace for those who make peace. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something and do not have it, so you commit murder. And you covet something and cannot attain it, so you get engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask, but you do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend what you get on your pleasures. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Our Gospel reading comes from the Gospel of Mark. chapter 9, beginning at verse 30. They went from there and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying, and they were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. Jesus sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be the last of all, and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them, and taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. People who know that I'm a farmer's wife so often ask, what's going on on the farm? How's it going? Well, the last few weeks have been somewhat of a roller coaster. We had the dry weather that we needed to be able to combine our crops. They're all now safely in the barn. And then two weeks ago, we had the great high of our daughter's wedding, a wonderful occasion. That was quickly followed by cattle escaping on the Monday morning, as they sometimes do. We were trying to find these black cattle amongst all the midst of the early morning light. And then we had our TB test, test for tuberculosis in the cattle that happens periodically. Sadly, that wasn't the greatest result. We had two lovely, fine, healthy animals who tested positive. And as you're, I'm sure, aware from the case of Geronimo, they have to be put down. It's all in oh, as a way of keeping us people safe from the awful disease of tuberculosis which we can catch from the cattle. Part of the saga of having a, a TB failure on a farm is you have to follow by various rules dictated by DEFRA. One of those is that if you have a reactor, your first, first failure, then you aren't allowed to have any cattle, new cattle come onto the farm 
until you've had your next test. So our test this time was the second test. We had one failure um, two months ago. And this time we had two failures. But even though we now have two failures, we now can have cattle come onto the farm under licence. I'm afraid I struggle to see the logic of not being able to have cattle that first time uh, come onto the farm, but then being able to the second time, even with a worse result. We are not allowed to remove any animals off the farm except uh, for slaughter. And since we're a beef farm, that's, uh, that doesn't affect the way that we operate nearly as much as the cattle that come onto the farm. I struggle with that wisdom from above, that wisdom from Jeff Jephra. Jesus' disciples had lived and worked with Jesus for three years. They'd eaten with him, they'd breathed with him. And they didn't get the wisdom from above. It wasn't the wisdom of other humans, but the wisdom of God that they struggled to get. The wisdom of God's kingdom. I wonder, God's kingdom so often seems to, his, his way of being turns things as we understand them upside down. I wonder what it is that you might struggle with in the way that God operates. It seems to me that we struggle as much now as Jesus' disciples did, even though we now understand a little bit more of his death and resurrection. For many, that struggle t there is a struggle still to believe in his death and more importantly his resurrection. In our culture we like to understand how things happen. We can't understand his resurrection, we can't understand the mechanics of it and so we can find that hard to believe. For Jesus' disciples there was less concerned with the mechanics of how things work but for them what they found difficult was that God, whose name was so holy it couldn't even be uttered, being in Jesus. And they could see there's something of the divinity of God in Jesus. How would God be, uh, would shame himself so utterly by going to the cross? They were so aware of the utter shame, the degradation, the agony uh, of someone being crucified. For them that was probably a much bigger issue than whether Jesus could rise again from the dead. So why would God, who was so holy, why would he call his own son to go through such horrors, such shame, such degradation? At my daughter's wedding, uh, the sun shone and I've said uh, how blessed I felt uh, by, th by the sunshine. And a friend quizzed me and she said, then said, but if that's feeling blessed, what happens when things don't go well for you? Is that being cursed? Is God cursing us when things go wrong? Those being crucified at Jesus' time were considered to be being cursed. And yet Jesus determines to take that route. Part of what he endures on the cross shows that, that, that there is nothing, um, nothing that we can endure that he hasn't been prepared to go through himself. There is nothing... Uh, more shameful, nothing more shameful that we can go through than he has already experienced. There's nothing in life that is be beneath him and beneath his care and attention. So often 
it's when we realize that that Jesus is with us in our difficult times that he understands that he knows what it's like to suffer so often that realization becomes a point of change for us uh, and of beginning of transformation and healing of course there was so much more going on God who is so holy chooses to be so humble as to live uh, and die in such a manner and that links into the other areas that the disciples just didn't get that strange relationship uh, of Christ and his enduring of such shame and the way that we so often look down on others and conversely the way that God loves each one of us each one each person we're made in his image we are bearers of his image and he loves each person equally we find that hard to grasp in several ways for some people that is uh, not grasping how much God loves them they don't feel worthy but God's love isn't conditional it's unconditional love it's worth noting that Jesus uh, that God speaks of Jesus at his baptism before he's done anything and said says this is my beloved son whom I love the story that Jesus tells of the prodigal son who does his best to hurt his father who does his best to squander the gifts that he's been given and yet the father still keeps a lookout for the son and he runs to embrace him to restore him to his former status when the son returns even though he returns in such uh, a degraded state and half starving Jesus love God's love is in unconditional for each one of us we still struggle so often to see others as God sees them in our culture in the UK we have a very hierarchical uh, uh, understanding uh, a hierarchical uh, st uh, structure in, in, our, in our thinking it's part of our culture we tried to iron out uh, the class system but there's still uh, a meritocracy that emerges we still there's still uh, a drive to uh, feel important we express that in the way that we dress the way the goods that we had so often our identity these days uh, is sought through our possessions the car we drive the house we have the kitchen, the bathroom, where we live. All things that build up status because we're still very driven by that. We're bombarded with advertising that helps to affirm the myth. You will be happier if you own this or that. But it is a myth. we build our culture on who's in and who's out Jesus teaches to be inclusive he reaches out to those on the edge of society and brings them in he illustrates his point in the passage we heard by bringing in a child we've made that a very cutesy image little child in his arms it was radical a child was powerless not the king or the queen of the household that they so often are these days but they were totally powerless and that's his point 
Today, I suspect Jesus would bring in a homeless person into the middle, that image of powerlessness to his disciples. Whoever welcomes one of these welcomes me. At St Stephen's, we've had a homeless person living in one of our doorways for the last 18 months or so. He's a gentleman who's been down on his luck. And he's been trying to stay away from the drink and the drug culture that is quite prevalent in the homeless community in Bath. We've helped him with food and clothing, with a sleeping bag, especially when he was first with us. But we've learnt recently that some in the area find his presence uncomfortable. Apparently, there is a word for this, which I discovered this week. The word is aporophobia. Aporophobia. It's the fear of poverty or the fear of poor people and the disgust and hostility towards people without resources. It's a word coined by a Spanish uh, ethics professor, uh, Adela Cortina. So it's not a phenomenon that is unique to the UK. But to be homeless is to be vulnerable to attack, especially at night. And we often find that there are homeless people on our streets asleep in the day, partly because they've been awake all night, just keeping vigilance, making sure they're not attacked. Often they will prefer to sleep in, a, a, in an open doorway rather than in, in, in an enclosed space. The violence against them can be awful and in a doorway they have a chance to escape. In cases where they have stayed in a caravans or sheds, it has been known that they've been set, a, set on fire because a homeless person was known to dwell there. And that is truly shocking. just because they don't have a home. I also learnt this week when discussing with some friends of the constant microaggression that someone who's homeless and on the streets can experience too. Those little gestures, those little looks of I don't trust you or of disgust when somebody, when they try and approach someone. It's an awful place to be, to have those constant uh, sneers, those constant uh, aggressive looks. We know ourselves how it feels if someone is a bit surly with us, how much different we feel if someone smiles or gives a uh, does something that's kind. Jesus' message is not always comfortable in the way that we live. But Jesus calls, uh, faith, uh, calls to those to faith in him as a wonderful gift. It's a way of connecting uh, with, with Jesus and with God. But it's also not just for our benefit but for the benefits of those around us, the benefit of others. As James so beautifully put it, God's wisdom, the wisdom from above, is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality, or hypocrisy. May we embrace God's wisdom and share it with the world. Amen. Let's 
take a moment now to pray. Let us pray to the God of glory, in whom we live and move and have our being. Loving Father, we pray that the church may hold true to the teaching of Jesus without being persuaded that worldly values of status and ambition are suitable or acceptable in Christ's followers. Lord, we pray for a spirit of humility to deflate all pomposity and arrogance. Pray that all in positions of power, authority and influence in our world may recognise their calling to servanthood and never lose their identity with the needs and longings of those they serve. Lord, we pray for those areas where there is conflict. For those in fear. We pray that all communities may look after one another, supporting the vulnerable, encouraging the timid, providing practical help for all who need it, and nurturing the young in a climate of trust. Pray that none may be considered expendable or beyond our cherishing. We pray for all who have lost heart or their homes through pain or suffering or sickness. Pray that God's redeeming power may work its wonders in the very darkest situations. We pray for those we know who are sick or struggling. Let's take a moment to bring those before God. The homeless in Bath or where you live. The poor, the disadvantaged. We pray that all who have wearily struggled to death may know the joy of burdens laid down and new lasting life transforming them through the eternal love of God. We pray that we may find new joy in giving and in serving freely without thanks, rejoicing in the privilege of following Jesus. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray with confidence as our Saviour, Jesus, taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. a blessing. May the outrageous welcome of the Father accept us for who we are. May the incarnation of the Word touch us and hold us close. May the wandering of the Spirit help us risk ourselves in love. 
and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you and those you love, now and always. Amen. As we say in our services, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.